Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Patrick Sawyer and I'm from the United States. Um, and I'm here today to uh, present to you the class struggle in today's America. Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, and um, I want to just first of all thank uh, Dima and Nikolai for, and everyone from the um, uh, Young Socialist University for inviting me here. Okay. Um, okay, and I'd like to uh, just first briefly go over my outline, uh, what I'll be speaking about. Um, obviously, this is a very broad um, amount, uh, a broad topic. Uh, there's a lot of information when it comes to this. So, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into depth about everything. <coughs> However, I'd like to give everyone a broad, general idea of many of the happenings going on in the States right now. Um, so, in America, um, it's obvious that uh, the, the states are really the center of the capitalist world, the capitalist system. And it's because of this that we obviously have no revolutionary, we are not in a revolu revolutionary situation at the time. And it's because of that I would like to basically go over the general status of the two major social groups, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. I'd like to discuss um, the state of the economy, uh, uh -huh. the institutions of power, major institutions, uh -huh. the 2016 election, um, and finally, some of the major play players and parties involved in this conflict, this uh, situation. Uh -huh. And um, it's, a, it's my opinion that by analyzing um, the class movements uh, within the last um, several decades, we can have a better understanding of the um, situation today that the country is in. Okay, and unfortunately for purposes of time and especially now that we have to translate everything, um, I really would like to um, limit this to, um, my presentation to the domestic situation. Um, however, if anyone has questions afterwards relating to foreign affairs, I can do my best to answer that. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see, I will, uh, um, I might have to change this a little bit, but in any case, I will be starting off with the uh, state of the affairs uh, previous to the election, a general overview of uh, the, uh, the two main classes. Uh, next, I'll be moving into the election cycle in order to um, go over some of the coalitions that came together, the social classes that came together to support um, the two major candidates. And then finally, I will be discussing uh, the, uh, the happenings in America following the election, uh, some of the um, responses that we've seen from social groups, um, as well as um, an analysis of the Trump administration itself. Uh, 
данной ситуации после выборов и проанализируем саму администрацию Трампа. And then following that, I would like to give some very modest uh, general conclusions about uh, what the possibilities may be for the future of the United States. Okay, so if we're ready, um, I think we, I can start with the state of the bourgeoisie. And I think in, un, in order to understand um, the 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 role that this social class plays in America today, we have to understand the beginning of uh, neoliberalism in general. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is is because. Uh, this change in the um, in kind of the the main functioning of capitalism is really the catalyst for many of the uh, conflicts and contradictions that we are seeing today. So, um, when it comes to the rise of neoliberalism, ideologically, yes, we have a Two favorite people here, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, Thatcher and Reagan, yes. Um, ideologically, um, neoliberalism pulls uh, from the works of Hayek, von Mises, uh, and Milton Friedman. Um, its characteristics improve, uh, include uh, privatization of national uh, industries, um, deregulation, budget austerity, and free trade. Идеологический неолиберализм зародился в работах таких экономистов, как Хайек и Фридман, которые выступали за либерализацию, свободную торговлю, дерегуляцию и приватизацию собственности. However, what's interesting about neoliberalism is that it also pulls a lot of rhetoric from the 1960s uh, student movements, including many of the libertarian, multiculturalist, and individualist aspects. <coughs> If you ever need me to repeat something, just let me know, okay? Yes, yeah. about student movements of the 60s. Of the 60s, yes. Uh -huh. How it influenced the neoliberalism. Correct, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, however, another thing that is interesting to note is that neoliberalism is different from traditional orthodox uh, neoliberalism, uh, because um, neoliberalism uses the institutions of power in order to make sure that uh, body politics, uh, countries um, reimburse uh, the debt that is owed to them at any cost, regardless of the um, cost to the local population. Understand? Uh, the political body, the political body, the government. Yes. So, neoliberalism uses governments to regulate the Well, governments, we also have international uh, institutions such as the IMF, the World Bank. They u neoliberalism uses these institutions in order to force uh, uh, recollection, uh, um, uh, repayment of the debt that is owed to them. In the example of Greece, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and this is different because uh, previous to this in orthodox uh, liberalism, um, they, uh, debts that were given to um, uh, populations were uh, given at a risk, yes, and if they could not uh, properly assess this risk, and they eventually these, these people could not uh, repay back the debt. Um, then the businesses were 
were meant to accept this loss. So I'd like to move. Uh, I'd like to move on to um, how the neoliberalism change uh, uh, came about, um, because obviously Hayek and many of these and uh, individuals that were um, theorizing uh, neoliberalism in the 1940s. It wasn't until about the, the 1970s that the economy changed to the neoliberal form. Mm -hmm. um, the justification for this kind of uh, shock therapy of the economy um, was the stagflation crisis of the 1970s. The economic crisis. Uh -huh. You can explain a bit about stagflation, what it is. Okay, well, stagflation is kind of uh, an economic crisis in which uh, interest, uh, or excuse me, um, um, inflation increases while at the same time unemployment is also increasing. This makes sense. Inflation and unemployment at the same time increase. Yes. Um, and one thing that, um, uh, and the kind of the justification for this came from Paul Volcker. He was the federal chairman, uh, federal reserve chairman at the time in the United States. Paul Volcker. Volker. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul Volker. Paul um, Volker. He was responding to this stagflation. Uh, he argued that um, uh, the only way out of stagflation was to raise the interest rates of the Federal Reserve, as we can see here. <coughs> Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, this is what happened in the 80s, and the result of this was an almost immediate recession, economic recession, economic crisis. So the result of Volcker's policies was recession? Correct. It stopped um, investment and growth. Because uh, interest rates were increased. Correct. It made it much more expensive to borrow money. And kind of the long-term effect that this had was, um, as we will see, this is kind of intended, yes? But it broke uh, union power in the United States. Uni uh, labor union power. Uh, because all, a lot of these uh, individuals were fired from their jobs. <laughs> Pretty simple, yeah. Um, so this this was the uh, initial shock, but as we will see, this. Um, there is actually a class element to this, which I'll explain in a sec. As you like, yeah? So, as you can see, the political neoliberalism is a class political bourgeoisie. So, um, when, these, uh, when the bourgeois class actually became, uh, came together, um, the first real instance of this is in 1971, uh, with uh, Lewis Powell, he is the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I was going to explain. I was just trying to go slower for you, yeah? Um, so he sent a confidential memo to then uh, President Richard Nixon 
he said that op opposition in the United States, uh, referring to specifically the student movements of the 60s, um, <coughs> had gone too far. Uh, he argued that um, the resources of American business uh, should be used in order to target major institutions in the United States, in order to change the way people, and speci specifically Americans, um, think about capitalism. Um, and we have to remember that in the 1960s, uh, much of the radicalism came uh, directly from the university system. Yes, and what they wanted, what Lewis Powell argued, we should they should be targeted, uh, were the universities, the schools, and the media. Um, on that, this is uh, obviously a very business friendly organization. We even see in 1975 on the center left with the trilateral, the le liberals, left liberals, uh, with the trilateral committee. This was headed by uh, President Jimmy <coughs> Carter and Samuel Huntington. He's famous for his clash of civilizations. Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington, and they, they said in uh, one of their reports, uh, something like democracy in crisis, I don't remember. The pendulum had swung too far towards democracy and away from uh, governance. Yes, and finally we see an actual collaboration when it comes to bourgeois interests in 1972. This is the Business Round Table. Uh, this is an organization of CEOs in the United States. That make that made up at the time uh, some one half of the gross domestic product in the United States. Uh, yes, and um, they they put this into action. They put the, uh, this um, uh, movement really into action. Their agenda was to regain political power for the corporation. Uh, they created many um, influential think tanks that are still around today, uh, such as the Heritage and. Uh, do you want me to name these or? Okay, okay. The Heritage Foundation, uh, uh, Manhattan Institute, the Hoover Institute, just to name a few. Uh-huh. With the purpose of obviously influencing um, uh, the United States. Um, they um, they even started a whole political movement. In the United States today, we have uh, what is now known as the Libertarian Movement, which is not anything like the traditional Libertarians. They are right Libertarians, almost radicals for uh, individualist, government-free capitalism. You understand? <laughs> yes. Uh, Ayn Rand was... Um, I think Ayn Rand was uh, probably definitely influential in this movement, but even Ayn Rand herself kind of distanced herself from these this, uh, these uh, libertarians. Um, but this is really uh, a creation of a movement when it comes to, for example, the political party. 
For example, the third largest political party today is the American Liber uh, Libertarian Party. They pulled in some close to 10, 12 percent of the vote. And yes? It was created uh, at the meeting uh, in uh, 1971? Uh, this was, well, after this meeting, yes. After, with a collaboration from the big, uh, the business class, big business was, class. Uh, in Russia, when you talk about libertarians, uh, yes, you exactly. think about Ayn Rand. Ah, uh, yes, yes, it is very similar to this, correct. But Ayn Rand came about a little bit before, and also she personally herself said that, uh, I don't agree with these, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for philosophical reasons, I don't know 100% about, I'm not a... Uh, a scholar of Ayn Rand, but at the same time, apparently she chose to distance herself from these, from this uh, movement. В общем, на этом собрании представителей крупного бизнеса в 72 году было решено создать либертарианскую партию. И я говорил с Патриком по поводу Ayn Rand, имел ли она какое-то отношение к этим либертарианцам, и по его словам, Ayn Rand, она старалась дистанцироваться от этого движения. Um. So we we see we see the creation after following this um, the organization of the CEOs of the Libertarian Party and another uh, major um, think tank called the uh, that was um, originally named the Charles uh, Charles uh, Koch Foundation, which is today named uh, the Cato Institute. В общем, на этом собрании, по которому мы постоянно говорим, было решено создать либертарианскую партию и еще один, еще одну неправильную организацию, название которой я не смогу привести. There was a lot of funding to prestigious uh, business schools, such as Harvard, Stanford, and the University of Chicago. Um, these became later uh, centers of neoliberal orthodoxy, um, uh, and the business press, led by the uh, Wall Street Journal, openly advocated for this neoliberal turn. So how this uh, organization was called? Uh, the Wall Street Journal? No, I mean the organization. Ah, uh, sorry, this is the Business Roundtable, yes? Business Roundtable. So. <laughs> so, following this, we see a real uh, political alignment when it comes to the political parties. Um, political action committees were funded uh, by big money. Um, political action committees are organizations in the United States that lobby the government with money. The first, um, the first party that was very, that was really uh, captured by um, uh, class power was um, the Republican Party with the election of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. Yes, and he was elected, and he put the neoliberal policies into effect. Mm -hmm. 1980 81, right? 1980 81, I believe, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, his policy was mainly one of austerity in the United States, uh, which included deregulation, tax cuts, the corporate rate was cut uh, um, very much. Um, there were confrontations with the unions, very famous ones. Uh, well, he, there were many confrontations with uh, the unions at the time because uh, they, uh, uh, there were some um, almost limitations of rights when it came to the unions. Um, but, 
but specifically there was a very famous one with the uh, confrontation with the air traffic uh, controllers union uh, which, which resulted in 11,000 of those individuals being fired. Mm -hmm. uh, and one, one last thing to add when it comes to him, uh, uh, a lot of the tax breaks that were instituted for uh, big, big business uh, permitted kind of the movement of capital from the union-held north to the union-free south. Uh -huh. And this is something that was very much used as a kind of bargaining technique in order to win strikes. Um, next, I, I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, Clinton because in 1993 with the election of Clinton, this is when uh, neoliberal elites captured also the Democratic Party. Um, because, because the party had a much less uh, of a, an emphasis on labor within their coalition, um, they became much more vulnerable to big money, big corporate money donations. The Democratic Party, yes, they became more vulnerable to uh, taking in uh, big corporate money donations in order to win elections. They were more or less support, the, Demo the Democratic before was more or less a social democratic party. They had a, yeah, yes, with, uh, with um, Franklin Roosevelt, yes, he created that uh, realignment, um, that uh, kind of where there was a almost a consensus for the most part between uh, bourgeois and labor for the most part. Um, but with the election of Bill Clinton, uh, this was destroyed. There was much less um, of, um, there was much less emphasis uh, uh, in the coalition when it came to labor and more of an emphasis on smaller kind of uh, postmodern like minority groups. In order that they needed to bring together in order to win elections. Because of this, it was ideologically kind of ambivalent, which meant that they required more corporate money in order to win elections. That makes sense. Right, and um, I know that was a lot, but I just really want to emphasize that it was this time that was the kind of catalyst uh, for a change in the economic model. It was a return of class power, and I would argue, like uh, Professor Dr. Harvey does, if anyone knows his works, uh, that it was actually a class project that brought about this change, a class project uh, by the bourgeois class. David Harvey, David Harvey, British. I think he wrote about economic geography, right? He did, but he he, he, he he writes a lot about Marx nowadays, and he has a good book uh, I would recommend to people uh, called A Brief, Hi a, a Brief History of Neoliberalism. It's a very interesting one. 
американского ученого Дэвида Харви и его книгу «Краткая история неолиберализма», которую он всем рекомендует. И в этой книге Дэвид Харви пишет о том, что либерализм – это классный проект буржуазии, политика буржуазии. Вот здесь на графике вы можете видеть средний доход 400 самых богатых американцев, 1992 по 2013 год. И мы видим, как этот средний доход постоянно возрастает. Начиная с 2022 года, когда там менее 50 миллионов долларов, миллион, да, 50 миллионов долларов он составлял. И пиковые свои годы в 2007 году, в 2012 году составляет уже почти 350 миллионов долларов. И средний доход 400 самых богатых американцев. И под заголовком к этому графику Патрик сделал возвращение буржуазного класса к власти. Um, right, so this is, as we can see, the effect of um, the neoliberal turn is that profits have just mainly exploded. Um, but I, I want to quickly turn... Результатом неолиберализма стало резкое возрастание доходов буржуазного класса. Right, and... Um, I'd like to briefly talk about uh, kind of representation in the government. Uh, who is it that rules in the United States? So, in a very famous um, study, very controversial at the time as well, um, by Professor Martin Gillings of Princeton and Benjamin Page, uh, that's not so important, um, they matched up, <laughs> not, that's so important to translate, right? But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, right, and in this study, they matched the legislative um, interests of average citizens, um, economic elites, and interest groups to uh, the data sets of what was actually passed. To understand? Yeah. <laughs> if there were any correlations, right? Um, the results uh, showed that the legislative agenda was skewed uh, disproportionately towards the interests of the economic elite. As we can see here in our uh, infograph here, uh, the results mainly came up for a legislative agenda uh, that, w that moved in the interests of economic elites. So as far as I understand, uh, this... Uh... Research uh, uh, is about how economic interests uh, are connected uh, with uh, political representation. Correct. В общем, исследование касается того вопроса, как экономические интересы различных групп общества связаны с политическим представительством. You understand? Basically, they are trying to match the interests of uh, average citizens. Are they the ones who have their laws passed? or economic elites, or is it uh, business or interest groups? Yes? And basically what the study showed was that um, the legislative agenda is being passed mainly in the interests of economic elites. So, which is what I wanted to say. Uh -huh. uh, theories such as the majoritarian electoral democracy theory, the idea is that uh, normal citizens have influence on the system, the average citizens, they totally failed. There was no correlation between their interests and the uh, legislation, legisla le uh, legislation being passed. Автор исследования пытается показать, существует ли какая-то взаимосвязь между интересами обычных граждан и законами, которые принимает Конгресс. И в результате с помощью математических методов 
выяснилось, что никакой корреляции между интересами среднего американца и законами, которые принимают его представители в Конгрессе, не существует. So, um, <coughs> another um, yeah, interesting um, phenomenon we kind of have we have to understand when it comes to representation in the American uh, government um, is money. Um, the role that money plays in representation. Mm -hmm. um, there was a la uh, recently there was a landmark um, Supreme Court case. Um, I, I won't go into the details because we don't have time. But um, basically, uh, corporations and unions were declared to have free speech, which meant that their money that they donate can be considered to be free speech. They have the right to donate unlimited amounts of money to elections. They can contribute as much unlimited yeah. as long as they do not directly um, donate to the campaign, they can spend as much money as they want uh, purchasing ads, advertisements on TV, putting things in newspapers, uh, anything, as long as they don't literally uh, communicate with the, for example, Clinton campaign or Trump campaign. Do you understand? I know, I know. That would be in, it would be in violation of electoral laws, basically. Um, but it's not so important. The idea is that they can spend as much money as possible. Um, when it comes to representation, um, obviously we have the two lar these two large uh, political parties, but maybe there are third options when it comes to uh, representing someone else's interests. Um, and when it comes to the American uh, state, um, third parties have very little influence. <clears throat> yes, um, and this is for a, a few reasons. First of all, they have no media coverage. Um, they have a lack of funding, um, and even uh, for the most part, a lack to a lack of uh, joining the national conversation. I'll, I'll explain in a second. <laughs> what do I mean when I say this? In 1987. Uh, the Commission of um, Presidential Debates was created, uh, and it's this organization is uh, jointly run by the Democratic and Republican parties. They are controversial because they have um, a 15% rule, which means that if you are not um, polling around 15% on most of the national polls, you cannot join the, the debates. Uh, 
Yes, and it's interesting to understand that um, this, the board of this organization that runs the debates um, is split between Democratic members and Republican members, and most of them are um, billionaires or ex-presidential uh, uh, cabinet members from either party. For example, maybe, maybe I don't know if you all, how many American officials you all know, but do you guys know Leon Panetta, by chance, ex-CIA, under Obama? Wow. <laughs> so, um, but it, uh, I, I want to go on to the next part, yes? Um, another thing that um, kind of limits uh, the voice of uh, the working class, I guess, when it comes to national representation is voter turnout. The amount of uh, individuals who go out, who are able to vote. Um, yes, so there's, there's obviously a correlation between having less money and not going out or not being able to vote. Uh, that's for several reasons. First, um, in every state, uh, the election is run in a winner-take-all election. <laughs> uh, when it comes to elections, every state is run in a kind of winner-take-all uh, election. This means that whoever gets the most votes wins all of the votes for the state, which means that the minority vote is not included. You mean the presidential elections? Yes. But, and also congressional elections, yes. And so because of this, many people feel that their vote does not count. Um, there are, there's been an introduction of voter ID laws which uh, dis, uh, disproportionately target the poor. A voter ID being you need a passport or an identification for this. And in, in the United States, it's important to understand that we don't have at birth kind of a national uh, <coughs> passport or something that we are given. Yes? And so, uh, at best, you have a birth certificate, but when they demand you to have, for example, a driver's license, that targets people who don't drive. They, they say that this is because of fraud. They are targeting fraud in elections, uh, people voting uh, several times, but these, are, these cases are incredibly wet, uh, rare. However, the people that are turned away from these from, uh, elections, from voting, are much, much higher in the thousands. So these, it's used kind of as a weapon in certain areas in elections. Uh, um, 2.5% of the American population cannot vote because they have a felony charge. They've been in prison. This is another reason why it's disproportionately signed up. Yes, they literally are not allowed to vote. Finally, uh, gerrymandering is a way in which politicians can change the borders of their kind of district in order to break the election, if that makes sense. 
Okay, and I'd just like to briefly talk about the media because unfortunately we don't have so much time. Um, uh, in the United States uh, today, 90% of the media that is consumed, which includes such a, things such as TV, radio, book publishers, uh, cinema, are controlled by six international media corporations. Свобода СМИ – это иллюзия, потому что средства массовой информации контролируются шестью крупнейшими медиакорпорациями, которые можно видеть здесь, на экране. Um, they operate more or less in a kind of cartel-like fashion um, in order to pursue their common interests. Они контролируют тем, что мы смотрим, для того, чтобы выявлять свои интересы. And um, we have to understand that with this kind of centralization, we also have a large amount of control over the amount of, over the information that is uh, kind of broadcast to the public. And. I, I want to go forward just because we don't have that, that much time, but um, I, if you all have questions at the end, I can maybe discuss about uh, filters to information uh, that professors um, uh, Noam Chomsky, everyone knows Noam Chomsky, has talked about and a little bit more about this, but I, I'm going to go forward. Yes? <laughs> Um, so, um, I think, I hope you all have a general um, idea of the recession. If not, I can maybe explain it a little bit more um, towards the end. Uh, but in general, the recession was uh, started because of speculation in the housing market. Um, one interesting uh, point of view that I would like to talk about is the one uh, advocated for uh, by the Marxist economist uh, Andrew Kleiman. Uh -huh. He has a very interesting book on this. It's called The Failure of Capitalist Production. If anyone's interested in this reading. He argues that the recession is not simply um, a problem of um, uh, bad loans, um, of speculation, but of a general decline in what Marx called the rate of uh, profit. And again, if anyone's interested in understanding a little more about, more about that, I can answer questions towards the end. But I'm going to skip now to the state of the proletariat in the United States. Um, and I think if you take away anything from this presentation today, it's this graph, which is uh, incredibly important. You can see, uh, starting in 1973, um, the the change when it kind of came to the uh, um, previous class compromise of the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s to the neoliberal model. Мы видим, что в период классового компромисса, который существовал в 30-е, 50-е, 60-е годы примерно, производительность труда росла одновременно с часовой оплатой труда. И с переходом политики неолиберализма в 70-е годы производительность труда продолжала расти, а почасовая оплата труда стагнировать примерно на одном уровне на протяжении более 40 лет. 
Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what you said. Per Perfect, yeah? And this is important because this um, is really um, uh, the catalyst for many of the uh, kind of class contradictions that we see today, that we will see in a moment. I'll briefly explain some of them. For example, um, when it came to a lot of the speculation in the housing market, the fact that um, wages have stagnated uh, has, has risen to um, a rise in household debt, mortgages, for example, which is one reason why there was so much speculation uh, in 2008, in the 2000s. Um, also during this time, there's been a large decline in union membership, uh, down from the uh, 50s and 60s, I believe, with some 35-30% of uh, workers organized in unions. Uh, it's now down to about 10 percent. And uh, it shows uh, the, the percent of uh, working Americans uh, or the unions. Correct. Uh, and, uh, well, working Americans. And what I think is interesting is, as you, you can see a clear correlation between the amount of uh, working Americans in unions and the share of the income <coughs> when it comes to uh, business profits going to the top 10%. That is what this uh, dark blue line is for. <laughs> Good. And there are several reasons for this, but if anyone has questions at the end uh, concerning why specifically this happened, I can explain. Yes? Basically, yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Labor is weakened, and as a result, um, profits stagnated, or uh, wages, excuse me, have stagnated. Um, and as we can see, very briefly, we have wages broken down between changes over time. So here we have, for example, the uh, top 1% of earners increased by some 138%, bottom 90% relatively, uh, for the most part, have stagnated. Um, if we break this down into very high wages, middle wages, and low wages, we see that very high wages have increased. Uh, decent amount. Middle wages have increased only by 6%, and uh, low wages have actually declined. Uh, but this is not because their wages have gone down, it's just that they've lost value relative to uh, inflation. Американцы мы видим, что американцы с самыми высокими доходами стали в час зарабатывать на 41% больше, чем в 1979 году. 
Американцы со средним доходом из среднего класса стали зарабатывать на 6% больше, чем в 80-м году, а те, у кого маленькие доходы, не доходы даже сократились на 5%. Um, ну, еще опять же, богатые богатеют, где они виднеются. The minimum wage um, in the United States, uh, the minimum amount you could be paid per hour, um, is currently at $7.25. This is about 400 rubles an hour. Минимальный размер оплаты труда в Соединенных Штатах составляет... It's 400 rubles an hour. The minimum wage. And uh, it's it's about the same for most of the states. Uh, there are some states where it's uh, maybe a dollar more, um, but it's about the same. Uh, it's not so important. Um, what is important is that in every state uh, in the United States, the minimum wage that is paid to workers, some workers. Uh, does not allow a worker to rent a one-bedroom apartment in any state. It does not, not basically, it does not allow allow uh, workers to live normally on that wage. <laughs> Dollars is seven dollars and twenty-five cents. Yeah, but it's uh, about four hundred rubles. <laughs> Это надо пересчитать в месяц. Вот. Ну, потом а, в общем, 400 рублей в час означает, что американец а, не может арендовать... А, state, штатов, с, с, он не может арендовать помещение. В общем, не может арендовать себе хоть какую-то недвижимость. So, it's, it's very difficult for people to live uh, with these wages. And that's because Uh, there has been a reluctance by Washington elite to increase the minimum wage relative to inflation. Um, for uh, reference, for example, in 1968, The minimum was worth about ten dollars in today's economy, which is almost double. When it comes to poverty, I think this is um, um, important to understand: is that um, there, there's still a large amount of poverty, even in the, the quote-unquote richest. Uh, country in the world. Currently it's at 13.5 percent. Uh, exactly. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, yes. But in any case, that, that's one reason why, because prices are higher, but they are not paid enough um, uh, according to the standard of living of the uh, places they are in. Um, but yes, the poverty rate is 13.5%, uh, which equates to 43 million uh, Americans living in poverty today. Um, in 2010, uh, so this is a little bit after the recession, but at the same time, uh, there were three and a half million uh, individuals who were homeless. Which is 1% of the population, um, and 18.9 million uh, vacant homes. At the same time, right? Uh, five to ten percent of the country is currently uh, going to bed hungry. They have uh, problems of um, uh, purchasing enough food for them. While at the same time, we have a problem with wasting 
uh, food things in our economy. One third of all food stuffs go to waste. Um, in general, poverty is higher for rural areas. However, there are also problems with poverty in some large uh, urban uh, cities, basically, um, uh, that are struggling after plant uh, factories have left the city. Something, uh, one specific case that has been very uh, big in the news recently has been that of uh, Flint, Michigan which is uh, pictured here. Um, uh, so in uh, Flint, Michigan, the government want, uh, chose to change the water source of the, for the, for the uh, city to the Flint River in order to save on uh, uh, um, uh, government spending. Uh, however, this led to uh, lead poisoning throughout the whole city. Lead is... Sweet. Uh, Lead. Flint, Michigan is a city, right? So, sorry? Flint, Michigan is a town. City. It's a large city. And it used to be a large uh, kind of uh, union town that uh, operated. The, the largest employer was GE, I believe. Uh, GE uh, cars, making cars at the time. It was shut down. It, they moved. They moved out of the city. This is the same place um, Michael Moore is from, if you know him. Yeah, he's from this city. Michigan, <coughs> Um, <clears throat> and so, because of this, uh, there are cases of families who refuse to pay the water bill, obviously because it's poisoned, and now these individuals are being evicted from their homes for refusing to pay the poisoned water bill. <laughs> Anyways, um, when it comes to students, um, students in the United States are in a very different uh, situation uh, today. Um, before, um, in previous decades, for example, my parents' um, decades, um, it was possible to leave university with relatively little debt, little student debt, and find an entry-level job pretty easily. Sorry? Uh, no, to leave university with almost no debt. For example, my mother went to university, a decent public university, and uh, within two months of working uh, as like a lifeguard at a pool, uh, she paid off you know, a whole semester. Whereas now it's just not possible in two months like that, you know? So the average debt for students now uh, leaving university is around thirty thousand, uh, which is somewhere in the ah, uh, it's in between. Uh, the average in total is about thirty thousand dollars. This is equal to two million rubles, mind you, for public universities. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 
However, depending on what school you go to, or what program you go, go into, or how long you can stay in school, some people stay in schools a little longer, um, it's not rare to find cases where uh, students are leaving uh, school with $100,000 and more, which is uh, in these uh, small uh, cases, but they do happen. This is 6 million rubles. In debt. Correct. No, university. This is university, yes. So, so six million rubles. Um, uh, when it comes to employment today, um, uh, students have to, are, it's much, it's a, there's a much more competitive atmosphere um, outside of university today. And because of that, graduates need to fight in order just to get uh, unpaid internships in order to get their foot in the door. Necessary experience. And so this, obviously, you can see this is a big contradiction if everybody, if students are leaving university with large amounts of debt and are only able to obtain unpaid internships, uh, there's a huge problem. And so basically what has happened now is um, many, most well, students in these uh, cases are taking uh, internships in order to get the necessary experience, um, plus um, a job on the side in order to pay the debt and stay with mom. Yeah? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so, very briefly, um, this is kind of the general change when it comes to uh, wages following students. This is the change in healthcare coverage um, for university graduates because we, we don't have a public healthcare system. Um, so, health care uh, that is given to you by your employer is very important. And as you can see, since the 1990s, uh, you were, normally if you did well in university, um, you had maybe a 60% chance of finding a job with health care coverage. Um, however, this is down to 30%. And notice it's even worse when it comes to just high school graduates. Uh, they, 7% of them, uh, just, just so you can understand, yeah? Seven percent of them um, can now expect to find a job with healthcare coverage today. Good. Um, so, um, when it comes to African Americans, I feel taking a class uh, based perspective on this, um, I think it's important to talk about uh, the situation for African Americans today because they are disproportionately represented within the proletariat. Uh, 
среди пролетариата афроамериканцы представлены в очень большой степени. Гораздо больше афроамериканцев относятся к пролетариату, чем белых американцев. Um, and we know this because uh, the poverty rate for uh, African Americans is much, much higher than it is for white Americans. Uh, the average uh, poverty, the average uh, amount of African Americans in poverty today is some 27.2 percent, which is incredibly high. In some states, the the number goes higher than 30 percent of them. Среди гораздо выше процентное соотношение бедных, чем среди белых американцев. А в целом 27 процентов афроамериканцев в Соединенных Штатах являются бедными. А в некоторых штатах этот показатель увеличивается до 30 процентов. Mm -hmm. um, and because of this, this brings about many negative stereotypes about them uh, in general, which, which results in negative consequences, such as higher rates of being jailed, and especially in uh, recent years, uh, higher rates of kind of police, uh, police uh, brutality. Mm -hmm. And so, as you can see, these are two um, famous cases um, of, of uh, protests that happened uh, in the past uh, several years. The one on the left is uh, Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and there was a protest after a, a black uh, a teenager, I believe, was shot uh, by police, but shot like nine, ten times, you know, after holding his hands up. And as you can see, the protests were kind of more or less brutally shut down by police. These are police, this is not the military, by the way, uh, with assault rifles and they have um, armored, uh, can't say tanks, you know, but armored vehicles in the city. Um, here on the right is um, Baltimore, Maryland, and there was a similar instance in which uh, the police were called in after uh, there were riots. Соответственно, негативные стереотипы в отношении американцев приводят к тому, что полиция очень жестоко обращается с ними. И на экране вы можете видеть фотографии из двух крупнейших протестов в США против жестокого обращения полиции. Слева это город Фергюсон, и справа это Балтимор. Yes. И вы можете видеть, что полицейские там вооружены автоматическим оружием, на них там жилеты, сзади можно видеть бронированные машины, все это используется против народа. So, um, there have also recently been uh, encount, um, uh, friction when it comes to uh, Native American tribes in America. Um, the most recent being uh, uh, with the um, uh, the Standing Rock Indian uh, Reservation, they've been uh, in the news recently because um, there is a planned oil pipeline uh, in the, we can see in the chart uh, below, that is planned to um, move uh, oil from North Dakota to Illinois. Why is this controversial? Because the planned pipeline is um, planned to go through the, um, <laughs> the lake, the water source, for this uh, Native American tribe and through their uh, sacred Indian bur burial grounds. Is it oil or gas? Oil. Uh, it's very interesting. In общем, теперь поговорим о индейцах, коренных американцах. Недавно был крупный протест резервации Стейтин Рок, вызванный тем, что Через эту резервацию должна пройти, должен пройти нефтяной нефтепровод э, из штата Северная Дакота в штат Иллинойс. Этот нефтепровод строится, и он должен пройти через озеро, которое расположено в резервации Стэнди Роха, и через священную землю для индейцев. И в связи с этим индейцы резервации протестовали против строительства нефтепровода. And, um... Recent protests, uh, as you can see on the right, were shut down by police with police brutality. Again, 
и полиция, соответственно, та же жестоко подавливает за протесты, как и в случае с афроамериканцами. Yes. Um, when it comes to migrants, there are, um, there, there re, um, in the past few decades, there have been large amounts of uh, undocumented uh, migrants who have come into uh, the United States, mainly from, the, from South America, Central America, 52% of them being of Mexican descent. <laughs> Это мигранты из стран Южной Америки, более 50% составляют выходцы из Мексики. Mm -hmm. And um, previous to this, there were not large amounts of uh, migrants that would come from down south. However, this, we have to understand that this is a um, direct result from uh, Bill Clinton's NAFTA, which created a free trade agreement with Mexico and kind of jumped, uh, started an economic crisis in the country which led to many of these individuals coming into the United States. It's a free trade agreement with Mexico America. <coughs> of the individuals in the states today, um, 8 million of them are active within the labor force, which is the large majority. So they are working, they are not taking the benefits, as the right always says. Um, 66% of them have been within the country for more than 10 years, so they are not recent uh, immigrants either. They have lived there for a decent part of their life. of these uh, undocumented immigrants have lived within the country for more than 10 years, 10 years or more. So, uh, here we have Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico has been in the news uh, recently because of the debt crisis. They're becoming more and more known as the quote unquote Greece of the Caribbean. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, they, believe it or not, uh, I don't know how many people know uh, the history of this, but this is actually an American territory that was taken from the uh, Spanish uh, almost a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago. Um, during the time of American, uh, they call it American imperialism, but it's never stopped, yeah? But the real American Empire days, if that makes sense. And so, basically, uh, to cut it short, um, the situation today in the in Puerto Rico is very similar to the one uh, in Greece, uh, wherein uh, the national government, because they don't have the the one hundred percent right to uh, uh, self determination for their own government, it is the Congress and the national government that can override and set their national agenda, their policy, um, and so because of this, um, Washington 
um, uh, it's which started under Obama, um, signed into law the uh, Oversight Board, which is uh, going to, uh, which is, uh, was created in order to force Puerto Rico in order to repay all of the, all of the debt owed to many of these New York banks and hedge funds at the expense of social services. America. Uh, no, but there, like I said, um, when when the the banks in the United States, we have to understand have uh, considerable control over um, the political system, and it's because of this the banks that New York banks that originally took money in the form of government bonds in order to help um, stimulate the Puerto Rican economy uh, did not find that return on their money. So they gave it to these hedge funds uh, in order to kind of force a payment out of them. Uh, and the hedge funds um, influenced the uh, federal government, which resulted in this legislation being passed to um, uh, force the Puerto Rican government to repay all of this money. So technically, it is not owed to uh, the American government. It's or owed to uh, large banks in New York. And the large banks, uh, they, uh, they the government No, they, they forced the uh, government to pass this legislation. They influenced the government in order to pass this legislation, if that makes sense. So, um, when it comes to prisons, uh, America has the highest rate of uh, prisoners in, in the whole world. Um, there are some 2.2 million prisoners uh, in the country today. This represents 22% of the world's prison population. Um, <clears throat> when, uh, uh, the majority of the, the large majority of people in prison today are not violent offenders, but in fact non-violent uh, offenders uh, who were committed, um, were put in prison for drug crimes. Possession, possession. This is a result of the anti, the Reagan Anti-Drug Abuse Act of the 80s. Yes, this is a considerable uh, factor in understanding why there are so many prisoners. И как раз это было связано с законом, который был принят администрацией Рейдера, когда стали осуждать на тюремное заключение за хранение наркотиков. 
Um, and uh, one final thing when it comes to this book. First of all, we have to remember that anyone uh, who is um, charged with a felony, um, committed a, who has committed a felony, cannot vote. So we can see that this, uh, that there, again, is a class dimension to this. There are the, the majority of people um, who are in prison today are, are, are uh, not coming from the, uh, the, the top 10, 20, 30 percent of uh, wage earners. They're the bottom earners, and uh, these are the ones that are targeted with voter suppression when it comes to uh, understanding our, uh, why the lower income brackets do not vote. Проблема в том, что американские заключенные это, как правило, люди из бедных слоев населения, а практически нет богатых, и у них, помимо того, что они находятся в тюрьме, они также лишены прав голосовать. Заключенные не могут сделать выбор. I, I just want to, um, there, recently there have been lots of disappointments when it comes to kind of neoliberal politics. I'm, I'm not going to go into uh, more detail just because we don't have as much time. Um, however, if there are any questions uh, involving uh, these issues um, um, at the end, I can go into more, I can uh, explain them to you, but there's been general uh, disappointments uh, among Americans in general when it comes to the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, the fact that the need, desperately needed health care uh, law that was um, passed by under Obama was, in fact, just uh, regulations for uh, the private market that kind of entrenched um, uh, insurance companies in the uh, process. Um, there's been a considerable amount of um, uh, the, 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 the security state uh, in, when it comes to, for example, the NSA, mass collection of data. Uh, all of these things have been uh, have grown uh, in the past 10, 10 years, uh, 15 years, since the beginning of the war on terror. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the next one in the next slide. Чем нас разочаровал неолиберализм? Во-первых, это продолжение войн в Ираке и Афганистане. Во-вторых, неудачная попытка реформы здравоохранения, которую предпринял Барак Обама, в результате государственной системы здравоохранения так и не появилась. Он просто пытался провести в жизни какие-то... Он пытался регулировать рынок здравоохранения, что не решило проблему в целом. И третий пункт – это полицейское государство, массовая слежка за американцами. At the same time, there's also been, also been a lot of disappointment when it comes to uh, how the um, crisis of 2008 and 2009 was uh, handled. Um, there was a lot of support for bailing out the big New York banks. Uh, but at the same time, there was not much uh, aid given to actual <coughs> workers who suffered from unemployment during this time. Uh, and here on the right, uh, Americans have, uh, uh, American workers have been suffering from changes in the economy when it comes to globalization, but mainly, uh, it should be said mainly, uh, technology, changes in technology that have um, uh, led to job loss and a, a general kind of de-skilling of <coughs> labor, laborers um, in the country. And just to explain this chart on the right a little bit, the, uh, we have each individual kind of uh, industry within the market. We have retail salespeople, uh, fast food, laborers, secretaries. Uh, the black or to here is where they are now, the amount of jobs within the economy. But when it comes to the black bars, these are the uh, jobs that are at risk of being lost due to automation and changes in technology in the next uh, 15 years. <laughs> Estimated. By the way, these are the conservative estimates. They're not the uh, higher estimates that are given. <laughs> Во-первых, тем, что 
правительство платит деньги банкам, чтобы спасти их от краха, и при этом, но при этом оно практически не помогает рабочим сохранить рабочие места. Мы видим на левом графике, что размеры занятости за последние 30-40 лет постоянно падали. Видите только небольшое увеличение больше 2010 -го года. Там показано количество миллионов рабочих мест на этом графике с 2010 -го года. А кроме того, в результате глобализации и технологического развития все больше рабочих мест находится под угрозой сокращения. Они представлены на правом графике. Там в основном различные маленьким текстом показаны разные неквалифицированные профессии, такие как, ну, относительно неквалифицированные профессии, такие как продавцы, повара, нянечки, медицинские сестры, офисные клерки и так далее, водители. В результате развития автоматизации эти, эти профессии находятся под угрозой сокращения рабочих мест и полного исчезновения. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about the election. Sorry, this is taking a little longer than I expected with the uh, translations, yes? But I'll, I'll, I'll be a little brief when it comes to uh, the election cycle. Uh, um, when we're talking about the Republican primaries, um, it's, under, it's important to know that Donald Trump, um, the who was at the beginning considered kind of a joke candidate, uh, just dominated the primaries, yes, which was very unexpected. Um, for him, he was seen as an outsider with very right-wing populist uh, rhetoric, building the wall between Mexico, um, opposition to free trade deals. <laughs> не рассматривался как серьезный кандидат, поскольку он выступал с разными противоречивыми предложениями, идеями, такими как построение стены на границе с Мексикой и так далее. При этом Трамп выиграл ранее с республиканской партии, что было неожиданно. Um... He, he is also seen by many in the opposition as a more, more or less authoritarian character. Uh, he has uh, called um, for the deportation of all undocumented immigrants. He has advocated for this Muslim ban, which has been big in the news. Uh, torture when it comes to the families of terrorists. Um, he has called Mexican immigrants uh, rapists. Uh, so he... Uh, this has been... Uh, and this has um, driven many, especially on the left, to uh, feel that there is kind of a shift towards a almost, you can't call him a fascist, but you can say there's almost a shift towards a, in that direction, if that makes sense. Трамп известен своими антимигрантскими заявлениями, в частности, он называл мексиканских мигрантов насильниками, требовал депортации, также он выступал за запрет ислама, за э, пытки в отношении членов семьи террористов и так далее. Um... For example, um, well, the far right in general has been very um, kind of energized by his um, election and uh, just prominence, I guess, in the whole process. Uh, for example, he's been uh, endorsed by uh, Don Black, who is kind of the most famous uh, neo-Nazi in the country. And David Duke, who is the ex-leader uh, of the Ku Klux Klan. If you all know, uh, uh, maybe you all know this uh, guy, Russian person who endorsed him, uh, um, Alexander Dugin. <laughs> if you are aware of him, also endorsed Donald Trump, to say the least. Yeah? Um, yeah. 
So there's this aspect, but uh, during the primaries, we saw that there was um, a lot of media kind of complicity in uh, promoting Donald Trump as a uh, viable candidate. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, with the constant controversy around Donald Trump, this brought constant media attention. And it was this media attention that made him actually uh, turn from a non-successful candidate to a very successful one on the I national stage. <coughs> Смелые заявления Трампа, его шуточки, антимигрантской стили, они принесли ему очень большое внимание в СМИ, и хотя на них посмеялись, это позволило Трампу стать известным в Америке и из кандидата аутсайдера превратиться в победителя. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and we have to understand though why, because when it comes to controversy in the media, I didn't have the time to explain in the past slide, um, when it comes to controversy, this is something that sells in the media. And for them, they see an opportunity to uh, have more viewership, higher ratings. And, but this is what ultimately led to him being such a successful candidate uh, during the election cycle. <laughs> Um, so when it came to the Democratic primaries, there were two main candidates. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about them too much. There were Sanders, uh, representing kind of the Democratic Socialist wing of the party. And uh, Clinton, representing the neoliberal kind of third way uh, wing of the party. Что касается демократической партии, она была представлена на выборах на правильных с двумя главными кандидатами. Это Хиллари Клинтон, которая представляла неоднократное крыло партии, и Берни Сайдерс, известный социал-демократ. Um, and uh, when it came to this um, uh, primary election, uh, for the most part, Basically, I can say that it was a, incredibly rigged in favor of uh, Clinton. There was um, undercover kind of um, uh, support for Clinton by the DNC uh, 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 as a whole, um, as the Democratic National Committee. Um, secretly, they <coughs> favored her the whole time, and there was collaboration between her campaign and the party organization as a whole. В общем, Клинтон была кандидатом любимчиком демократической партии, ее всячески продвигал национальный комитет демократической партии, и он сфальсифицировал выборы на праймерис в пользу Клинтона и против Сандерса. There was also uh, colluding when it came to the Clinton campaign and a large media firms. Соответственно, крупные медиакорпорации также поддерживали кампанию Клинтона на праймерис. And uh, if you all, I have more on this, but I won't go into detail, it's a little long, but um, in general, um, uh, reports um, speculate that, um, the, that uh, corruption when it came to uh, this election cost uh, Sanders some 368 delegates in the total count, an estimated. 360, one thing that is uh, specific to the Democratic Party are superdelegates. Uh, these are these voters right here. We have these are the normal pledged voters that are uh, won through uh, actual elections. They are actual um, voters. However, the superdelegates are uh, Democratic Party um, officials. They are represent. They are people within the Democratic Party apparatus. Many of these high-ranking officials have a vote in who is chosen by the party. This was instituted, uh, um, I don't remember when it was instituted, to be honest. 
Um, but this was basically instituted in order to water down support for uh, populist candidates. And you, as you can see, they overwhelmingly went to Clinton. Clinton had some 602 of these people, uh, whereas Sanders had 47. And what's uh, another interesting thing is that all of these individuals, for the most part, um, uh, endorsed Clinton before the first uh, primary election even occurred. <sighs> Клинтон была избрана кандидатом в президенты еще до того, как начались, собственно, праймерис. И вся машина демократической партии, ее руководство, они все работали на то, чтобы Клинтон утвердить в качестве кандидата. А Берни, соответственно, это один из сторон. So, when it comes to the election, there are, uh, we, we can see um, kind of the um, the the uh, different classes that come together to support uh, different candidates. When it came to Clinton, she was mainly supported by uh, bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie. Why? Because in American elections, as I've explained before, um, money is an essential tool to winning an election. Normally, in most normal elections, uh, whoever has the most money typically goes on to win. Хиллари Клинтон – это кандидат крупного бизнеса в Соединенных Штатах. А мы видим на этом графике, что Клинтон собрала на свою предвыборную кампанию значительно больше денег, чем Дональд Трамп. 500, ну, практически полмиллиарда долларов она собрала денег. Из них 206 миллионов это деньги, привлеченные со стороны от средств крупного бизнеса, их список можно видеть справа. Там такие известные люди, как Джордж Сорос, который дал Клинтон 7 миллионов долларов на предвыборную кампанию, и Стивен Спилберг, который пожертвовал миллион долларов на кампанию Клинта. И там э, также есть имена других американских бизнесменов. А Трамп э, собрал только 300 миллионов долларов э, на свою кампанию. Он получил их от Комитета Республиканской партии. <coughs> uh, Trump um, had much less support when it came to uh, the bourgeois class. However, in the very being a part of the bourgeoisie himself, he was able to finance his own campaign in the early days with a small loan of like a couple million dollars or something. Yes. So. <coughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and so this was, um, this was the um, kind of, in brief, uh, Clinton was mainly supported by uh, uh, bourgeois individuals, um, and we will see the, the numbers break down uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, when it comes to Trump, um, the mainstream kind of uh, narrative uh, when it came to uh, the mainstream media was that it was uh, racist, white, working class uh, individuals who won the election for Trump. Um, and if, if you look at their numbers, it may, they, it, it can be a little bit convincing, and this is what a lot of people in the United States uh, believe today. Uh, if we can look at, for example, the white votes, the difference in the black votes, uh, men, non-college graduates, um, many of these, for the mainstream narrative, uh, uh, kind of confirm this uh, belief, um, but I'd like to address this myth because um, uh, the, there are also um, 
there's also a lot of data in the polls that directly goes against this narrative. For example, uh, for example, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, crushed uh, Trump when it came to the under 30 percent vote, when it came to the 30 to 49 percent vote, 50,000 and below, which is pretty representative of proletarians. uh, I don't know 100% everything you said, yeah? Um, but when it comes to Trump, the median income for a Trump voter was 72000 This is much, much more than the national income, which is $56,000. Um, so already, this kind of uh, go against the typical media narrative. The largest uh, supporters for Trump <coughs> were within this 50000 to $200,000 uh, uh, income a year, which is nowhere close to the wage of a working man. This puts them already <laughs> in the 70 to 90th percentile. So already we can see that this narrative is just false, is plain false. В общем, разные по размерам доходов тех, кто голосовал за Трампа, говорят о том, что за него голосовали скорее люди с более высокими доходами. А средний доход американцев в год составляет 56 тысяч долларов. За один год столько зарабатывает средний американец. А средний избиратель Трампа зарабатывает в год 72 тысячи долларов, то есть за Трампа голосуют люди, которые and finally, one last thing that also kind of confirms this is the fact that um, this, this working class that is supposedly uh, uh, supporting Trump um, if we remember from before, working class individuals and especially lower class individuals in general typically have lower rates of voting, of participation. And we can see this here. The 30 to, under 30 to 50,000 uh, percentile, uh, we only see 17 and 19 percent. Whereas the uh, labor aristocracy and uh, petit bourgeois uh, realm of uh, income is much higher. We have much higher participation rates, which kind of shows that there, most of the voters who came out to vote were in this uh, percentile of income earners. <laughs> На выборы в избирательные участки пришли только 17% американцев, у которых доходы составляют менее 30 тысяч долларов в год. В то время как, в то время как среди тех, кто зарабатывает больше, на выборы пришло значительно больше значительно больше людей по этому соотношению. The more probable narrative that I would um, argue is that there was actually large uh, support from the petit bourgeois class uh, when it came to uh, the Trump uh, coalition. Um, we saw high, uh, during the primaries very high support uh, from small business owners and the self-employed uh, for Trump. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, and this is for several reasons. Uh, one, small businesses were hit much, much harder than larger businesses during the recession. And many of the policies that Trump are, is proposing um, are, are very sympathetic to them. Um, when it comes to, for example, uh, obviously Trump was a very controversial figure uh, when it comes to things such as uh, immigration, but this doesn't necessarily go against a class um, um, uh, interest. Uh, for example, um, in 2006, uh, the Federa National Federation of Independent Business, okay, uh, they're the largest small business um, association in the United States. Um, they gave a survey when it came uh, for their members um, when uh, they asked if illegal uh, immigration was a problem. 90% of those individuals said yes. 70% said it was a serious problem, illegal immigration. Малый бизнес он в целом положительно относится к таким сомнительным идеям Трампа, как, например, его выступление против мигрантов. Потому что когда национальная ассоциация владельцев малого бизнеса провела опросы для своих членов по поводу отношения к иммиграции, 90% высказались в пользу того, что иммиграция является проблемой. Ah, sorry, that is here. Uh, when it comes to protectionist policies, very, very few small businesses earn um, a decent amount of income from abroad. Uh, only 5% of small businesses really earn income from exporting to other countries. So this doesn't necessarily go against the, his uh, free trade policies. Uh, excuse me, uh, anti-free trade policies, excuse me. Когда Трамп выступает в поддержку протекционизма и против свободной торговли, это опять же нацелено на поддержку малого бизнеса, который не заинтересован в внешнем рынке. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, is it possible that uh, small businesses were large enough of a force in order to influence the election? Uh, in the United States, though, um, there are currently 30 million small businesses. Um, who employ half of the voting population. Um, and in the surveys that we, 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 we looked through, we, um, we understand that 94% of all small businesses were planning on voting and had already decided on who they were planning on voting for. So it's very possible that of the around 60 million um, votes cast for Trump, it's very possible that a large amount of these uh, small business owners or people associated with them, families or anything uh, with similar interests, helped Trump to become elected. We're probably the leading force in his coalition. So that was the election, and obviously Trump won. Um, I'm going to briefly go through a lot of these um, very quickly. Um, if, if you, again, if you have any questions at the end about uh, some of these, um, some of the events uh, following the election, I welcome you to add, um, ask me a question regarding that. Um, but, oh, sorry. Uh, basically, um, We've seen since uh, the election a large consolidation of capital in the in Trump's cabinet. They are worth together over thirteen billion dollars. 
общее состояние составляет более 12 миллиардов долларов. This is the GDP of some uh, 70 small countries. А что составляет, что сравнимо с уровнем ВВП 70 небольших стран? Uh, just for a little bit of perspective, um, they are five times richer than the Obama cabinet. 30, uh, and 34 times more richer than the Bush administration. 34. Uh, and I won't go... If anyone wants, I have a list, but if anyone wants information on some of these individuals, I can give it, but uh, it's mainly filled with uh, actual, you know, um, Forbes 400 capitalists, uh, politicians, and uh, heads of the military. Uh, so, since then, um, the Trump administration um, has um, proposed a budget that uh, they, they, where they propose to cut some $3.6 trillion from, uh, from, from the budget. Um, basically, it's an across-the-board austerity program when it comes to the federal government. <coughs> Uh, the biggest cuts are coming to uh, Medicare, uh, food assistance program, uh, food, is, bleh, food assistance uh, programs uh, for the poor, and the Environmental Protection Agency, the agency <coughs> uh, to protect the environment. Uh, the EPA, that's the Environmental Protection Agency. They're, they are pre prepared to take a, a large hit when it comes to their budget. Uh, because uh, Trump is um, wants to promote business interests as opposed to uh, environmental re regulations. And he also believes glo uh, climate change to be a hoax. So this is why they are taking a big hit. Uh, so, there is one major exception to uh, the budget. Uh, one uh, uh, department is actually getting a large increase in funding, and that is the Pentagon, the military. Ten percent increase, which all, already with its bloated budget uh, is a huge increase in money. Uh, so there have been a few... Uh, um, large executive actions that he has taken since becoming uh, president. Uh, one of them was the withdrawal withdrawal ugh, from this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a uh, proposed free trade agreement with many countries in the Pacific, in Asia. Um, he has ordered the renegotiation of uh, major trade deals, including NAFTA, uh, um, uh, who apparently, it was rumored, excuse me, it was rumored that he would uh, get rid of NAFTA. Uh, however, um, apparently, I don't know full details on this, uh, there were some major uh, um, uh, capitalists who... Uh, convinced him to, uh, to, to do otherwise, to not do so. NAFTA is uh, the free trade agreement between America, Mexico, and Canada. But basically all free trade uh, agreements are kind of on the table again from being renegotiated. 
Также он собирается пересмотреть все другие соглашения о свободной торговле, которые имеются в Соединенных Штатах. Uh, he's ordered the advancement of this controversial uh, oil pipeline that is going through Indian territory and through uh, major uh, American rivers, river sources. Um, he twice has instituted uh, what the opposition calls a Muslim ban, Muslim ban. Um, uh, he calls it the travel ban, but basically it blocked um, uh, Muslims uh, coming from Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, many uh, of these countries, um, whether they have a visa, residence, permit or not, uh, from the country. Он запретил не Соединенные Штаты жителям таких стран, как Ирак, Ливия, Иран и так далее. Несмотря на то, что у них может быть даже право на жительство в Соединенных Штатах есть, они не могут больше переехать в Соединенные Штаты. Um, but as this brought um, basically mass confusions at a lot of airports as well as mass protests uh, uh, in, uh, uh, um, from uh, liberal and left groups. Uh, but luckily though, um, both the original um, uh, travel ban and the revised form have thus far been declared unconstitutional in the courts. Um, obviously, the, uh, very recently there was the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement uh, when it comes to the climate change. Uh, and so that makes the United States one of three countries that is not a signatory of this agreement. Correct, yeah, Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Um, yes. Um, okay, yes. Uh, so there's a little bit of the mainstream uh, response to his election. Um, there have been very, very large uh, liberal protests um, uh, on and before Inauguration Day. One of them was this uh, Women's March, um, who brought in, uh, I've heard estimates from half a million to three million. I, I don't know the exact estimates, but a large amount of uh, uh, liberals uh, came out to protest his uh, inauguration. It was a protest against uh, his uh, sexist remarks, right? Basically, yeah. Uh -huh. Теперь мы поговорим о либералах. Либералы организовали большие протесты после инаугурации Трампа. На картинке вы можете видеть участь, участниц женского марша против Трампа, в котором приняли участие от полутора до трех миллионов человек. Женщины протестовали против сексистских заявлений Трампа. Um, when it comes to the... Ah, uh, there also have been very um, high-profile investigations into collaborations with Russia um, and the firing over the FBI, uh, head, the head of the FBI, James Comey, Comey um, which has resulted in very high support for um, his impeachment. Half of the country is in favor of removing him already as president. <laughs> Um, when it comes to the Democratic Party, um, while during the election cycle they called they called his uh, candidacy. Um, uh, a disaster and a move towards fascism, but now, uh, as a whole, in, sorry, 
Implorables, yes, um, that's true. Um, now they are more or less uh, arguing that we should give him a chance. Yes. Uh, yes, well, first of all, uh, there were only about eight uh, Democratic senators that um, consistently voted against his cabinet, his very highly controversial cabinet. President Obama himself uh, said that we should give Trump a chance, literally said that. Uh, Clinton said that we should accept pre uh, Trump as our president. So, for all of the talk about uh, fascism and deplorables and all of this stuff during the election, they're now go turning the other cheek, kind of, um, now that he's in office. Um, and when it came, there was a um, an electoral uh, campaign for the um, the Democratic National Committee, the head of the party, basically. Uh, for the president of this organization. Um, and despite the large uh, showing of uh, progressive um, candidates uh, during the election, uh, the large support for Sanders, um, the progressive wing was again uh, shut out from leadership positions in this party. Uh, basically, uh, there was one leadership position uh, given to uh, Keith Ellison, who was kind of a well-known progressive in the states, the rest of the leadership positions were given to centrist, uh, Obama-era uh, officials. As for the Republican Party, there's not much to be said. Uh, they also had many uh, members who were against um, a Trump presidency. Um, they were back and forth on support for him. Uh, but now they've basically come to support the president, for the most part, in order to pass their legislative agenda while they have the chance, while they control all branches of government. <laughs> Um, and the mainstream media has been very, uh, the, the uh, image of him has been overwhelmingly uh, negative. Um, and in my opinion, this is kind of a sign of uh, clashing bourgeois interests at the moment uh, between the typical, um, I guess, neoliberal direction and again the uh, protectionist, almost populist movement of uh, Trump and his petit bourgeois um, uh, coalition. Um, um, uh, he's been, uh, he's responded by censoring uh, many of the uh, media outlets uh, from his press briefings, very large ones. He's called the media the enemy of the American people. I, I don't lie, I, serious? Go ahead, go ahead. Trump, uh, he is, his administration is a, notorious for lying, but he calls these, they call these uh, alternative facts. Yes? That's, uh, um, <laughs> he claimed, for example, that uh, around 3 million people voted illegally in this election. He claimed uh, he invented a terrorist massacre in order to justify his Muslim ban. Um, and he claimed that Obama wiretapped his hotel. Trump, uh, voted, 
дай Боже, это вот единственный запрет на мусульман, он придумал теракт, которого на самом деле не было. А также он заявлял, что Обама прослушивает отель, в котором он живет. Uh -huh. and, and 3 million people voted illegally, you said that? Yeah? Okay, fair enough. What do you mean by He claimed, that's what Trump said, he claimed that 3 million people voted illegally, and that's why um, uh, Hillary Clinton had a higher uh, vote tally in the end, if that makes sense. He's very egotistical, he can't lose at anything, basically. Um, uh, I, I'll oh, no, briefly talk about uh, the far right. Um, normally I would not because I don't think they're so significant, but because of this uh, election they have grown uh, very strong, um, uh, especially because of the failures of uh, neoliberalism. Um, hate groups have been on the rise. Uh, we've seen since 2015 an increase in anti-Muslim groups um, go from 34 uh, groups in uh, 2015 to 101. Uh, there are now two times as many deaths from right-wing groups than there have been since jihadists, since 9-11, as we can see in the right uh, uh, graphic. Um, there is a large uh, following of, uh, there is a large organization, um, there are a large amount of kind of right-wing uh, militias in the United States. Um, and they are interesting because they're very American uh, phenomenon. Uh, they have their origin in the 90s, and ideologically, they have very high, large, strong uh, Christian identity uh, roots, um, uh, libertarian, when I talk about this American libertarianism, anti-tax, anti-immigrant, anti-government uh, views. Um, but what makes them interesting is that they are ideologically pull a lot from uh, uh, conspiratorial views, conspiracy theories. Uh, for example, um, the American government, they believe that the American government is coming to take their guns. Which is a constitutional right, by the way, but they believe this. Uh, they believe that the United Nations and uh, NATO will create a one world government. NATO, yeah. <laughs> and they believe that Obama is a secret Muslim who's come to institute Sharia law. Uh, so, obviously, you know, uh, it's, it's ridiculous, but they are very strong in the United States right now. There are some... <coughs> Um, 276 of these militia groups within the country, um, they saw a large increase from uh, the Trump presidency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they organize themselves in a uh, kind of pseudo-military uh, organization. Uh, they are always wearing khakis, they are, they are armed with uh, assault rifles, they are always practicing, and they have regular confrontations with uh, government agents. 
винтовки, автоматическое оружие и часто конфликтуют с полицией. There has uh, now been kind of a, a rise uh, in uh, kind of uh, rebranded nationalism, libertarianism, neo-Nazism, uh, white supremacism. Uh, uh, they call themselves the alt-right. They're kind of a newer uh, phenomenon in the United States. <laughs> Alt, alt right, alternative. That's what they call themselves. Uh, alt right, yes. Uh, I just want to talk about some of. Mm, I'll briefly talk about some of these individuals. Steve Bannon on the right, uh, top right here in the black jacket. Um, he is the ex he's the executive chair of Breitbart News, a far-right uh, media outlet in the United States. He now works in the Trump administration. Steve Bannon. Uh -huh. he was, he's believed to be the brainchild of this Muslim ban. Uh, next in uh, the bottom left, uh, this individual with the cowboy hat is uh, David Clark. He's a sheriff um, in, uh, in a small county in the United States. He's a big Trump supporter. Um, and he, uh, you know, is, is <laughs> I could consider him a real fascist, yes? Mm. Uh, I, he advocates for suspending habeas corpus, which is the right to see uh, a, a judge, to go in front of a judge, to hear your case, case uh, heard. Uh, he um, advocates sending uh, these suspected terrorists uh, to Guantanamo Bay to be tried by the military. Uh, and he's estimated, in his es estimates, that hundreds of thousands to almost a million people sympathize with uh, the Islamic State in America. Uh, yes, and he is expected to join the Trump administration on the Homeland Security Department, in the Homeland Security Department. Uh, he is very controversial because being the sheriff, he was in charge of the local county jail. And during this time, uh, he's had several deaths of inmates, uh, including a newborn baby. Uh, this baby was born in jail. A newborn baby. It was uh, born in jail and the mother was refused <coughs> medical attention before and after. Uh, in the top left, this individual is Alex Jones. He's the owner, he's, he's cuckoo, seriously. Uh, he is the owner of Infowars.com. Uh, it's a Another far right conspiratorial, mainly conspiratorial uh, news outlet um, with a very large following. Alex Jones. He's known for many of his globalist uh, conspiracies uh, and support for Donald Trump. Uh, 
uh, some of, he's the propagator of this Pizzagate scandal. Can you translate that? <laughs> I will try if you explain it later. Yes. Uh, Ari Jones, so, создатель вот этого заговора Pizza. Pizza Gates. Pizza it's like for Gates to refer to a scandal, yes? Um, he claimed that um, in emails between Hillary Clinton and John Podesta, who is the uh, uh, um, uh, campaign chairman, um, there were there there is an alleged apparently uh, child sex ring in a local Washington D.C. pizza restaurant uh, where they were all of the Democratic elites were having fun. If you understand. Basically, in the email, yes. Jones, среди документов, которые выложили в сеть хакера, хакер выложили в сеть переписку между Клинтон и руководителем ее предвыборного штаба. Алекс Джонс прочитал эту переписку, нашел там упоминание пиццы, и он решил, что вот это упоминание пиццы говорит о том, что в Вашингтоне существует Sex, no, sex ring. Yeah. And I think it's important to say this. Why, why do I say this though? Is is not just to laugh at him, but because one of his followers went in with an assault rifle and killed everyone in this police pizza parlor. <laughs> so he is influential to say the least. He uh, said that Obama is plotting a Bolshevik revolution against Trump. And he's he said that Russia is prepared to launch nuclear weapons in America. Yes. Uh, finally, on the, the bottom right, uh, this is Richard Spencer. Uh, he has been uh, becoming more and more prominent because he's been kind of on the streets uh, recruiting uh, Trump supporters and disenfranchised uh, liberals. Um, he's just a re basically a rebranded uh, white nationalist. Um, Richard Spencer. He's had uh, some of his. Um, ah, an, an interesting fact is that he wants, he advocates for an ethno state. Uh, like, quote unquote, like they have in Russia. Ethnostate. Ethnostate, one ethnicity, only white people. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I have a uh, few others, but I'm not going to uh, talk about them because I prefer to talk more about uh, the left parties uh, in America. Uh, I think uh, a few of them do. Um, I could definitely say Alex Jones is a fan. He's had, by the way, Alex Dugan on his show. Alexander Dugin has been on uh, his no, show knows. here. Um, I, I, I would assume, yes, he likes them. Uh, Steve Bannon, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, I couldn't say. Um, so these are... Uh, the left parties in the in the United States right now, um, they 
being again the, the core of uh, um, the capitalist system, uh, the left is, is not so strong, especially since Fukuyama's end of history, the end of the wall, right? the fall of the wall. Um, but I would like to talk about a few of them uh, for a moment. These are the socialist parties. Um, Социалистическая партия, старейшая левая партия США, Каузическая партия Соединенных Штатов, Democratic Socialists of America. И вот эта эмблема с It should say socialist parties, not Marxist parties. Демократические социалисты Америки. So I want to just briefly talk about their uh, politics, uh, the party on the PSL, uh, in the top left, is the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, they, uh, by many accounts, can be considered the largest uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, party in the country. Uh, they're uh, led by Gloria Lariva. Who is the, the party leader? Uh, they've been um, uh, active in organizing demonstrations uh, against imperi uh, American imperialist actions around the world. Uh, they are supportive of both uh, both uh, Cuba, the current Cuban and Venezuelan governments, and have been invited to meet the leadership in those countries. And uh, they've recently been very active in many of the anti-Trump protests. Uh, next we have Socialist Alternative. They are probably the largest Trotskyist group in the United States. Um, so they are the U.S. section of the Committee for Workers International, CWI, yes, if you know uh, They are led by Kasama Sawant, who is a city councilwoman in Seattle. Uh, Sawant. I think she's of Indian origin, I'm not sure. Um, they, they claim to be a revolutionary party, um, but uh, they run in elections in order to gain supporters. Um, they've been supported by many of, they, they've supported many of the uh, more progressive uh, social democratic uh, candidates um, the past uh, few decades, such as Ralph Nader and Bernie Sanders. They've, they've supported his uh, campaign. And after uh, Sanders uh, kind of lost at the hands of uh, uh, Clinton, uh, Sander, uh, they called for Sanders to run as an independent candidate in order to draw away as many progressives from the major two parties as possible. And they've seen, they've been very active again in the Trump protests. Uh, they've called for his impeachment, removal. They've seen a very large increase in membership since uh, he was elected. Um, next we have the Socialist Party, USA, who is uh, far to the right. Um, they are the successor to the original uh, Socialist Party of America, and they consider themselves democratic socialists. Um, they consider themselves non-reformist, however, they've really been supporting candidates within the Democratic Party since they um, uh, were, were organized, reformed. 
статистическая партия не считает себя реформистой, при этом они поддерживают кандидатов от демократической партии. Um, we have the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, they are a multi-tenancy pressure group, should be said. They're not truly a... They put pressure on uh, main, um, mainstream candidates. They're full... They are, their members include Social Democratic, Democratic Socialist, uh, New Left, and pro-labor uh, individuals. Basically, they fight for reforms. Uh, they've endorsed many uh, Democratic candidates. Basically, they've endorsed the Democratic candidate uh, for president every year. Uh, Walter Mondale, Jesse Jackson, Ralph Nader, John Kerry, Barack Obama, Sanders. Yes, so... Finally, the Communist Party USA. Uh, they were at one time were the largest uh, Marxist-Leninist party in the United States, as they were recognized by the the Soviet Union. Today, they're basically liberals who like the color red. <laughs> why, do, why do I say this? Because they're highly reformist. Uh, this year, for example, they endorsed Clinton over Sanders. Uh, the running kind of the joke, the running joke amongst the left in the states is that. The only remaining uh, members within the Communist Party are um, undercover FBI agents. Um, there are several Maoist uh, collectives in some of the large cities in the United States, uh, but they're, they're mainly working on the uh, community level. Um, um, and they are operating, like I said, in larger uh, cities such as Austin, uh, Houston, New York, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. Uh, they called for, a, in general, uh, they're, they're, they, they don't really have a centralized leadership, uh, national leadership, but in general they called for a boycott of the recent election. Um, however, and they've been very active um, in protests, um, uh, against uh, police brutality and the rise in uh, right-wing hate crimes. So there have been uh, some actions done by uh, the anarchists recently. Um, there was um, there have been several um, protests of uh, right-wing uh, organizations and organizers that were shut down by uh, Antifa groups. Uh, mm -hmm. The one specifically here on to the right is the University of Ber California, Berkeley, where a um, one of these alt-right members came <coughs> to speak. They were invited to speak by the kind of the young Republican group of the university, and the Ant Ant Antifa protesters came and shut it down. Yes, and they, uh, during this uh, specific uh, 
um, demonstration, there was an Antifa individual who was shot by one of these uh, um, uh, uh, alt-right supporters. Uh, on the left, we have uh, anarchists during the um, inauguration of Trump. Um, and during this uh, protest, they operated in what they call a black bloc um, uh, organizing. I don't, I don't know what I can call that. Yes, basically, they, they dressed in all black. They smashed uh, corporate windows and set fires to many uh, corporate buildings in Washington, D.C. Uh, there are several left um, uh, militia organizations in the United States, however, they, they are much, much smaller than those of the right. Um, I, I'll talk about uh, two that I know of. Uh, per, uh, uh, the first one is the Huey Newton Gun Club, which is uh, named after the famous Black Panther Party for Self-Defense leader. Uh, their coalition of organizations mainly made up of African American members, and they organize in order to fight police brutality. Um, on the right, we have the organization called Redneck Revolt. They're prominent, predominantly made up of uh, rural whites, and uh, they organize in order to fight traditional fascist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, they've recently been organizing, they've recently been uh, demonstrating in many pro-Trump or uh, uh, rallies in order to win over uh, members to their cause. They've, <laughs> they've been demonstrating in many pro-Trump uh, rallies, people supporting Trump, where many of these uh, rural whites, uh, these working class individuals uh, that are supporting Trump, they are trying to win over comforts to their cause. But they are rednecks, right? Rednecks, yes, but, <laughs> yes. В общем, это видники против расизма, которые также участвуют в демонстрациях сторонников Трампа, чтобы вести там пропаганду против Трампа. Finally, uh, on the left, we have the syndicalists. <coughs> Um, this is the International Workers of the World. Uh, they are the, the original uh, Wobblies, yes, as they're called in the States. Um, they are much, much smaller than they were at their height in like the 20s, I believe. Uh, today they have around 13,000 uh, members. 13,000. <coughs> Um, recently, they've been organizing to protest against uh, uh, um, kind of uh, slave labor, slave labor in the prison system, to protest for prison reform and abolition. Um, and in last last September, they were able to rally uh, protesters in some twenty states in order to protest the prison conditions, the wage slaveries, and the right to unionize. Um, and I, I had to quickly kind of skip through it uh, before, uh, but during these prison protests, uh, in the prisons today, there's a large amount of uh, prison labor that is going to big corporations. And the prisoners who are working for these corporations, Starbucks, Victoria's Secret, uh, are earning 20, some 20 cents an hour, which comes out to like 50 rubles an hour, something that, you know, incredibly small. 
том, что в американских тюрьмах заключенные работают по заказам разных крупных корпораций, в том числе Starbucks, Victoria's Secret. И они при этом получают значительно меньше, значительно меньше оплату, чем свободные рабочие, около 20 центов в час. То есть 50 рублей в час. So, we've come to the end. <laughs> what conclusions can we draw from uh, this vast amount of information? Yes? Um, I would argue that this is definitely a time of change uh, within post capitalism. So like the Le Pen phenomenon, Syriza, uh, Brexit, and Greece, uh, we, we are seeing kind of an angry uh, reaction to neoliberal politics in the form of the Trump uh, presidency. However, we should understand that Trump, obviously being part of the bourgeois class, he is riding the coattails of honest, uh, honest. He is riding the coattails of mass unrest. Legitimate unrest. So we should understand that it, it, so many people in the states are uh, shocked that he became president, uh, but we should understand that, it, that this is not an anomaly, this is a symptom of the capitalist system. Um, we're seeing a lot of contradictions when it comes to bourgeois interests with the typical uh, neoliberal elite and the populist kind of revolt when it comes to uh, this uh, Trump movement, popular populist movement. Um, and for the most part, Trump has been kind of re reined in by capital uh, so far, but in the future we have to understand that his politics will prove to be uh, more and more popular amongst uh, people. Um, uh, no, no. I'm saying for the most part, uh, the forces of capital have kind of uh, calmed him down a little bit for the most part, but at the same time, uh, those policies that he proposed, especially during the election, are going to become more and more popular in the future. Maybe not necessarily with Trump, but with other candidates. Um, and it's for this reason that uh, I think it's possible to say that it's there there's the possibility that we're witnessing the end of the neoliberal state in the United States, the neoliberal economy. Um, there are several reasons for this, such as the changes in technology and globalization in the United States are uh, resulting in lower living standards for many working people. Uh, all of these things are causing political uh, polarization, uh, which would kind of explain the Trump and Sanders uh, phenomenon. Um, and many people on the left have uh, been rightfully worried when it comes to his authoritarian tendencies. They see it as a step towards uh, a fascist state. Uh, 
person, me personally, I don't think that he's he himself is a fascist, but I think his uh, the the views of his uh, support, many of his supporters, and uh, some of the individuals in his uh, uh, around him are very worrying, which almost makes me uh, wonder what will come next when it comes to the progression in this, in this uh, right-wing movement. When it comes to uh, the economy, uh, obviously if uh, Andrew Kleiman's uh, analysis rings true, uh, because there was no destruction of capital uh, during the um, economic crisis in 2008, uh, it's possible that this will just lead to more and more speculative uh, driven crises in the future. So you said that uh, the crisis will repeat again. It's it's very possible because uh, Andrew Kleiman is uh, refer uh, arguing that the crisis was a result of a general uh, low rate of profit for companies because this capital was not destroyed in the way that it was uh, during the Great Depression and uh, the uh, World Wars. Uh, there has been no general rise in the rate of profit, which means they will need speculative kind of measures in order to raise investment because accumulation in general is low relative to investment. Sorry, it's a lot, uh, no? It, um, regardless of where you stand politically when it comes to uh, the I know and I know his, his analysis is controversial but in any case I think it's an interesting perspective to take in, um, take into account. Um, but anyways, uh, regardless of where you stand on the political uh, spectrum, most economists agree that the American economy is in a very fragile state. And no matter how a crisis comes about, we have to understand that uh, another crisis like this will further polarize the country, further left and further right. <laughs> Um, when it comes to democratic participation, as we see wealth become more and more concentrated in the hands of the bourgeois class, um, we will see more attempts by the proletariat and even the petit bourgeois class to uh, vote for populist candidates like we saw in this election. Um, and if that's the case, the elite, like they did in the democratic primary, will try and set, will try to set more and more limitations to the democratic process in order to <coughs> kind of win power back from the populist wings. Um, well, like we saw in the contest for the uh, Democratic candidacy uh, nomination, um, they, the elites uh, um, really tr attempted to uh, take, um, rein in uh, kind of democratic processes in order to keep the populist candidates for winning, from winning. Finally, no. In any case, um, uh, it's the last thing. I apologize. Yes, uh, there's a large possibility for further uh, radicalization. 
Um, many among the left, the right, and uh, liberals in general are feeling what Habermas called a kind of legitimation crisis in the United States. Uh, many of the institutions, uh, political institutions in the United States are incredibly unpopular at this point in time. The Congress, the presidency, the police force, the judicial system, higher education. Uh, sorry? Okay, well fair enough. Um, and the fact that the economic system uh, is uh, um, having uh, many uh, problems for many a large uh, portion of the population uh, is causing uh, mass unrest and uh, um, polarization, which we can see amongst the left uh, in the campaigns of Sanders and Jill Stein and the Green Party. Uh, this could lead to further support for the socialist organizations uh, on the left. Uh, when it comes to uh, center-left liberals, um, they've been much more active in these protests, and this is something I believe that socialist parties could benefit from. Um, when it comes to uh, the millennials, uh, for example, they uh, this is important to understand because millennials are much, much more open to the ideas of socialism, whereas in the past, uh, uh, older generations, they were not affected by the changes to the from the neoliberal economy, and they were not affected by this Cold War propaganda. And it's for this reason that many of these working class, uh, millennial individuals consider themselves to be uh, working class, and consider themselves to be against capitalism. Uh, there were some 50% of millennials who said that they would vote for a socialist, whatever they consider that to be. And I, I, I believe that all of these factors uh, could possibly lead to a reinvigoration of the left uh, uh, in the United States today. Последние два пункта, на которых Патрик хотел бы заострить внимание, это кризис институтов и появление социалистической альтернативы в Штатах. Mm -hmm. Кризис институтов связан с тем, что как, с чем согласны все политические силы, левые и правые, что в американском обществе значительно понизилось доверие к революционным институтам, к судебной системе, к Конгрессу, к президенту и так далее. И одновременно с этим увеличилась популярность социалистических идей, в первую очередь среди так называемых миллениалов, то есть людей, которые родились после 2000 года. Они не затронуты ментальностью холодной войны, вот этой антикоммунистической пропагандой, и около 50% вот этих молодых людей, они сторонники социалистов. В частности, многие вот из них поддержали Берни Сандерса. Поэтому Патрик считает, что, возможно, эти факторы говорят о том, что в будущем произойдет возрождение левого движения штата. Спасибо.